Well, as we enter into our message time for this morning, I just wanted to give you kind of a sneak peek at what's coming ahead in the future here. And so um, this morning we're going to be starting a new sermon series, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And that series is going to take us through Labor Day. But next week we have a special guest coming to share with us. Uh, maybe some of you know Jay and Allison Tolleson. Uh, they are uh, basically being commissioned as missionaries through an organization called Village Missions. And the premise of Village Missions is that they want to serve rural communities in the United States by sending out uh, couples or, or men to be pastors of small town churches. And so Jay is going to have the opportunity to preach next Sunday. I will be here, but Jay will be preaching, and we will get to hear more about his heart for the local church and what God is calling him and his family to do. And so really excited to hear from him as well. And then after Labor Day, uh, we're going to be starting a new series that um, kind of our backyard barbecue is going to help kick off as we enter into fall, and it's going to be all about family. We're going to be talking about matters regarding family discipleship, and I'll have more details of that in the coming days. But that's where we're going, but this morning we are starting a new series called Ordinary Christian, an ordinary Christian. What I want to do in this series is I want to spotlight someone in the Bible who you probably haven't heard too much about. Maybe someone you haven't heard a sermon about before, someone who is, by most accounts, a pretty ordinary Christian, a pretty ordinary person. But when you dive deeper into their life, you really find out that they are nothing short of extraordinary. Because here's the thing, we've all heard stories in the Bible about uh, biblical heroes, right? And for good reason. Obviously, the biggest hero of the Bible is Jesus, right? He's what it's all about. He's our Lord and Savior, and so rightfully, he is uh, the primary character of the whole book of the Bible. But you also have other people in the Bible who are highlighted for their faithfulness, right? In the Old Testament, you have heroes, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, like Abraham and Moses and Esther and King David and Daniel. And then when you get to the New Testament, you have people like the Virgin Mary or John the Baptist or Peter or the Apostle Paul. All of these people are amazing testaments of God using sometimes flawed people to do extraordinary things, to do great things for his glory. But sometimes when we look at these stories, we sometimes put a barrier between us and them, right? Because sometimes it can be hard to see how their extraordinary faith relates to our lives, right? Sometimes it can be hard to relate to the Blessed Virgin Mary, or it can be hard to relate to St. Paul the Apostle, right? It's hard to do that. And even in modern days, I think most of us wouldn't maybe see Mother Teresa or the late Billy Graham as being peers with us in some way. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to follow Jesus and be like him. But sometimes we put some people up on a pedestal and maybe too high of a pedestal at times. And it's hard to see the commonality we have with them. But what does it look like then to follow Jesus in a life that is by all accounts ordinary? A life of an ordinary person who wakes up at 6 a.m., drinks some bad coffee, and goes to work every single day. The person who is constantly dealing with mountains of laundry, with moody children, and trying to balance a budget. Or a person who can't imagine doing great things for God because they have a hard enough time doing things around the house. What does it look like to be an ordinary Christian with extraordinary to be an ordinary Christian in an extraordinary way. And that's the heart of the series we're going to be starting this week. And so what I want to do is I want to introduce you to the character we're going to be looking at this coming month. His name is Barnabas. Now, just so I can get a feel for the room, who's heard of Barnabas before? Anybody heard of Barnabas? Most of us have. Anybody ever heard a sermon on Barnabas before? Maybe one of us has. Okay, so he's kind of someone who's a little bit behind the scenes. So if you're familiar at all, we first hear about Barnabas in the book of Acts. And again, the book of Acts, if, you're, if you know the Bible at all, it tells the story of the early church. It's about everything that happened immediately after Jesus died and rose again and then ascended back into heaven. 
And so Jesus goes back into heaven and the disciples are left to kind of figure everything out on their own. Except now they have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when you get to Acts chapter 4, we begin to see a picture of what the early church looked like. And really it's a beautiful picture of uh, disciples sharing their possessions. Everyone has everything in common. But almost as an aside, in that in Acts chapter 4, we're introduced to a specific member of the church. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 36. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. We're told about a guy named Joseph who demonstrates that he is all in on being a part of this Christian community. He has a plot of land that he sells and he puts the money at the disciples' feet to disturb to distribute amongst the other Christians. And we really are told very little about him. We just know a little bit about his background, what tribe he comes from, what place he comes from. And we don't know how he became a Christian. We don't know if he knew Jesus personally. But we just see that he is committed to the faith. He's committed to this cause. And the main reason we don't know much about him is that he isn't mentioned really that much in the Bible at all. He isn't the star of the show, so to speak. He's just an ordinary Levite guy named Joseph. But this Joseph also had a nickname, which I've kind of discovered is like everyone else living in New Albany, right? Everyone seems to have a nickname in this town. And maybe you have a nickname, or maybe you had a nickname growing up. You know, perhaps, you know, I think nicknames are often given to people if they uh, you know, if it has something to do with their personality. So perhaps you know someone who's a pokey Pete, right, who shows up a little late all the time. Or maybe, you know, I knew someone, I knew I had a student in my youth group who was, his name was Scott, but they call him Skeeter because uh, the kids on the swim team kind of thought he was a little annoying, like a mosquito in your ear, so they called him Skeeter. Um, when I went to Bible camp growing up, my nickname was Suitcase. Uh, mostly because there was already another Tommy, and my last name was Case, and so they called me Suitcase. So Joseph has this nickname, and it's Barnabas, but really it's not—it's meant not just to be a nickname, but it's really meant to be his new name altogether, right? We see this a few times in the Bible where Jesus, for instance, he changes Simon's name to Peter, or he changes Saul's name to Paul. To Paul excuse me. Joseph's Joseph's new name is Barnabas, and it means son of encouragement. And that's because that's what Barnabas was like. He was someone that people found him to be very encouraging. And so this is going to be our kind of our big idea for today. Barnabas shows us how an ordinary Christian can be an extraordinary encourager. When I was a junior at Crown College, which is a small Christian college up in Minnesota, I had the opportunity of being what they called a student chaplain. And so each year at at Crown, two students would be asked to serve as student student chaplains. And really the primary role of a student chaplain was to be a kind of like a spiritual leader on campus under the guidance of the campus chaplain, the full-time faculty member. And a big part of being a student chaplain was helping coordinate and lead the multiple chapel services that would take place on campus. And sometimes, as a student chaplain, this would involve me standing up in front of the student body and speaking. But the problem was, for me, is that I was terrified of public speaking. I was on the speech team in high school, but it's a little different in speech. You're speaking to a classroom But at college, I was speaking to an auditorium of 500 people. So it was pretty, pretty intimidating. You know, I wanted to be a pastor, but the preaching part was something I wasn't that excited about. And so I was extremely nervous about speaking in front of people. And and, and actually, people could tell later on that year, some had a girl come up to me and say, wow, like, you've really grown, like, when you got up there at the beginning of the year, I like would feel bad for you because you would just look so nervous. And so I was scared. I was scared to speak. But thankfully, my first duties as student chaplain were usually pretty small speaking things. Like I would just have to give an announcement or tell about an upcoming event on campus. 
But what I noticed is that each time I would give an announcement after the chapel, my campus chaplain, a guy named Dr. Bill Kuhn, who was also my supervisor, would come up to me after the service and compliment my announcement. He was always very enthusiastic. He'd be like, great job, Tommy. That was clear. That was concise. You made good eye contact. Way to go. And, and looking back on that, I always kind of laugh a little bit. Because <laughs> it was just an announcement. <laughs> I was just announcing that I was that something was going on on campus, that there was something students should do. But, but he was always so positive. And looking back at that year that I got to serve as a student chaplain and the time I spent with Dr. Kuhn, I began to see this clear thread. That in every part of that job, he was always encouraging me. He was always giving me positive feedback, lifting me up. And what that did is it made a huge difference for me. I went from being nervous about speaking to all of a sudden having this inner confidence out of almost nowhere. That's kind of in, it was kind of instilled in me that God was calling me to do this and, and, and that I had the capability of doing it well. But I strongly believe that it was only because Dr. Kuhn had encouraged me in the small things and expressed his belief in me that I was able to give, to find that confidence to grow as a speaker. There's something powerful about an encourager, is there not? There's something powerful about having someone in your life who lifts you up, who, who urges you to press on, who believes in you, even when you don't believe in yourself. Well, what we see from the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is that Barnabas was this kind of person, an ordinary Christian who was an extraordinary encourager. How was Barnabas an encourager? Well, let's look at the relationship he had with a specific church, the church in Antioch. To find out. So look with me at Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30, and it's on the screen here. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, who was stoned to death because of his faith, they, they traveled far, as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of them believed and turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted or encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So here's what we have going on here. At this time, a great persecution has broken out amongst Christians, right? People are really starting to target them with persecution, and so they've been kind of scattered all over the region in which they're living. And before this, Christians were primarily sharing their faith with Jews, right? They wanted to convert Jews from Judaism to Christianity. That was their primary target. But all of a sudden, in the city of Antioch, Christians began to do something completely new. They began to share the gospel with Gentiles, or those who were not considered to be Jewish. And what they found is these people were very receptive to the good news about Jesus. And so, Almost overnight, a brand new church is planted in the city of Antioch. And this is all great and exciting. And so the news of this new church plant reaches the ears of the primary Christian leaders in Jerusalem. But as exciting as this new church was, these leaders wanted to make sure that everything was going smoothly. Because Antioch was a tough place to be a Christian. The city was corrupt with immorality, perhaps probably best illustrated by the presence of the Temple of Daphne, where uh, ritualistic prostitution was commonly practiced. The Church of Antioch was off to a good start, but they had unique challenges that they had to face. And so the leaders in Jerusalem sort of sent out our man Barnabas 
to check out the situation and to make sure everything's going all right. And so Barnabas comes to this church, and what does he do when he gets there? He encourages them. He lifts them up. Specifically, he encourages them to remain faithful to Jesus in the midst of the cultural pressures that they were facing. And we're told the reason why he encourages them in verse 24. It says that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. I think this statement gives us a clear picture of who Barnabas was. If you were here last week, we were talking about uh, John 15, where Jesus says he is the vine and we are the branches. And really the, the concept we were focusing in on was this idea of vitality, right? When something is vital, when someone has this vitality, there's an exuberant energy that's almost infectious. And I think Barnabas here is an example of someone who has vitality. When he enters the room, the dynamics change. There's a renewed sense of energy, excitement, because he uplifts the people around him. People know that when they have a conversation with him, they are going to be encouraged. And so with this in mind, my question to you this morning is this. What do people feel when you walk into the room? How do people react when you walk into the room? Do you add life to the room? Or do you kind of suck that life away? Usually a person who's going to take energy out of the room is someone who is a constant critic. A constant critic is someone who always sees the negative in others. Someone for someone who looks for what has gone wrong and kind of focuses in on the negative parts of life. So for instance, if you're out to eat with friends, you almost always have something bad to say about the food or about the dining experience. Or in casual conversations, you are very quick to challenge the opinions and the thoughts of others in a way that makes you look superior to them in some way. Or maybe when you get home, one of the first words that come out of your mouth when you walk through the door is uh, maybe expressing uh, your, your disgust that are complaining about something your spouse did or did not do. I know this isn't something I struggle with, right? If I have an expectation that the dishes are going to be done or that dinner is going to be ready when I come home and I walk through that front door and those things aren't done, I can tend to complain, right? And that's being critical. The fact of the matter is that nobody likes being around a critical person. When they walk into the room, they can create a sense of uneasiness and tension. And really at the heart of this kind of negative criticism is pride. Pride in that you believe that you know better or that you can do something better than anyone else. And so you quickly look down on the shortcomings of others. And this isn't to say that criticism is always bad. Right? There's such a good thing as constructive criticism when it's given out of a heart of grace and love for that person. But if, if negative criticism is all that you have to say, if that's the primary thing coming out of your mouth, it can really take a toll on your relationships. So with that in mind, compare the constant critic with someone who's an enthusiastic encourager. This person is someone who brings energy to the room and to the people around him. And the primary way that you can uplift someone is by encouraging them. That's how you bring energy. What I don't mean here is some sort of disingenuous, half-hearted positivity, right? It can almost be more damaging to be half-hearted or not a genuine in your uh, enthusiasm or encouragement than uh, being critical, right? That can almost be more damaging. Being fake is almost worse than being critical. To be an enthusiastic encourager is at the very essence to practice humility in how you view those around you. Look at how the Apostle Paul describes humility in Philippians 2. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Humility is considering others more significant than you and, and counting them better than yourself. And I think the biggest reason why we aren't always quick to notice or to encourage others is that we're so focused on ourselves that we fail to notice the successes of others. 
Being an encourager takes the humility of intentionally paying attention at others in a way that allows you to notice something they are doing, right? To notice what they are doing well and then publicly affirming that gifting in them. You know, earlier I mentioned my friend and mentor, Dr. Kuhn, and what you need to know about Dr. Kuhn is that he is an amazing communicator. He is a very gifted preacher. If anyone deserves uh, affirmation and deserves uh, being highlighted, it's him. He's incredible at that. But what he did with me is he humbled himself to a certain degree in such that he took notice of an insecure college kid giving announcements. And he took the time to speak words of life into him. He considered me to be more significant than himself and truly went out of his way to make me feel valued. What he did for me is it gave me the confidence to grow in my speaking, but it also encouraged my faith. It encouraged my faith as well. Being an enthusiastic encourager requires the humility of valuing others more than yourself by putting them in the spotlight. Putting others in the spotlight. But that can be hard for us sometimes. Am I right? That can be hard because we like to be in the spotlight. So for instance, if we look at a basketball metaphor, which person would you rather be? The person doing the slam dunk? The person who's kind of the star of the show who has the highlight reel? Or do you want to be the guys in the background on the bench cheering him on? But that's what an encourager does. An encourager intentionally sits on the bench and cheers the other person on, even if they're better at basketball than that guy, so that he can receive the spotlight, so that his abilities can be highlighted. That's what it looks like. As we'll talk about in the weeks to come, Barnabas shows us that an ordinary Christian can show extraordinary extraordinary faith by being an encourager, encourager to those around him. Well, as we talk about this, there's one more aspect of encouragement that we see from Barnabas, and I think it's important for us to notice. So look again at the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 14. When they, which is Paul and Barnabas, had preached the gospel to that city, which is the city of Derbe, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And when they got there, they strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, in saying that through many tribulations or trials we must enter the kingdom of God. Christ-centered encouragement doesn't just make others feel good, but in a very real sense, it strengthens their soul. We read in Acts chapter 14 that Barnabas and Paul, after various missionary endeavors in which one of them, Paul, almost is killed, they returned to the church in Antioch, and there they strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. The primary purpose of their encouragement was so that these young Christians wouldn't get discouraged in the faith and so resort back to an old way of living. And so the primary purpose for our encouragement is really to strengthen the souls of those around us in a way that will encourage them to continue in their faith and remain committed to Jesus. Have you ever considered the fact that the words you say to encourage someone can have a lasting impact on them? Even just some of the words that are insignificant to you, that they might have a lasting impact in some way. You know, I think this is especially critical for young people. Uh, the, according to research done at Fuller Theological Seminary, a youth institute out, at, uh, out in California, one of the keys for a teenager keeping their faith after they graduate from high school is having at least five caring adults, five adults who care about that person, five Christian adults who encourage that teenager to be constantly investing in their life or being actively investing in their life when they are at church. Five adults who speak life into them, who show genuine care, and who encourage them in the faith. And just trust me, this kind of encouragement, it doesn't have to be profound. 
doesn't have to be like a profound theological blessing. You know, I remember when I was a teenager, I was driving with one of my youth group leaders who, speaking of nicknames, his, his name was Moose Lips, is what they call them. I was driving with Moose Lips to one of our church softball games. And I was, I was horrible at church softball. These guys were very gracious to me to let me play, or they were just desperate for players, one of the two. Uh, but, but I was driving with Moose Lips to this game, and I was in the middle of a conversation with him. And I'll never forget how during the middle of our conversation, Moose Lips looks at me and goes, you're a good egg, Tommy. You're a good egg. That's all he said. But I'll never forget that. And I don't necessarily know why, except for the fact that in that moment, that adult looked at me and affirmed to me that he liked me. That he thought I was cool. I was a good egg. It was simple. It was insignificant. Probably He's probably completely forgotten about that. But you seriously may never know how far your words of encouragement could go. But encouragement isn't just vital for young people, right? We all need encouragement as well because sometimes we feel insecure. Sometimes we feel insecure in our life and we feel insecure in our faith. We can get discouraged in our faith. Life is hard. There's always children who need things from us, bills that got to be paid and a job that has the everyday demands. And all of that, it can be hard to stay encouraged in our walk with Christ, especially when our faith begins to kind of conflict with our life and there's tension there, right? Like maybe you, it's like, I want to go to church, but it's always a battle to get the kids ready in the morning. Or I want to give to the church. I want to give to charity, but man, budget's really tight right now. Or, or I want to share Jesus, but my coworkers are very critical of me. They ridicule me every time I bring it up. Life can be discouraging, and so times, so, so sometimes our souls get tired. But when you have someone who's constantly speaking life into you, it changes the whole dynamic. It can almost change your day. And when you speak life into someone else, you just might be giving them the strength that they need to carry on. Life is hard, but encouragement strengthens the soul. There is unbelievable power in an encouraging word. Here's why encouragement is so powerful, and I'll close with this. I don't want to get too technical here, but Barnabas' name means son of encouragement, which in, which in the Greek language is huios paraklesios, which is the form of the Greek word paraclete. Now, this is kind of some biblical trivia here, but does anybody know who the paraclete is in Scripture? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples that he's that after he goes up to heaven, he's going to send to them a paraclete or a helper to encourage the believers and teach them all things. The paraclete is what we know as the Holy Spirit, right? As you guys just said. With all this in mind, may I propose to you that when you encourage others, the Holy Spirit... The great encourager is working directly through you to strengthen a soul in the faith. That the words you speak aren't just words. It's the Holy Spirit working through you to build others up. That maybe perhaps one of the most visible ways that we can see the Holy Spirit working in the church is in how we encourage each other. The Holy Spirit lives in every ordinary Christian. We all have the encourager within us that enables us to encourage others. And being an enthusiastic encourager is one way that God helps an ordinary Christian have extraordinary faith. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the the great encourager to us the helper to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to lift each other up. That, Lord, we wouldn't focus on the negative, though there's time for that, that we wouldn't be a constant critic, but, Lord, that we would be an enthusiastic encourager, that we would have the humility to value others above ourselves in a way that we take notice of them, that we intentionally sit on the bench 
cheer them on. So Father, help us to have words of grace, to encourage one another. And Lord, we continually thank you for the cross, for your good gift of grace to us. So Lord, it's this in mind, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. So again, as we go from this place, we're going to sing a song, but after we do, I want to remind you we're going to have our little powwow meeting for the backyard barbecue outside, um, but also that we'll have our time of fellowship and just hanging out together. Um, with this, though, please stand and receive uh, this benediction or this blessing from Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and on God our Father, who loved us by his, and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, may he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word.